at a time. Coming up next on Arizona Horizon, an Arizona town hall borders on border and trade issues. That's what it's about, and we're going to talk about it next. Also tonight, we'll hear about efforts to learn more about one of the moons of Jupiter, and we'll see how horses and inmates are helping each other. That's next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Arizona PBS, members of your PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. The former head of the State Department of Economic Security is joining the Trump administration. Clarence Carter was DES director for over three years until he resigned under pressure in early 2015. Carter will be working as the director of the Health and Human Services Department's Office of Family Assistance, which oversees nearly $17 billion in annual welfare grants to assist families. During Carter's tenure at DES, it was revealed that more than 6,000 child abuse and neglect hotline calls went uninvestigated, which led to CPS being spun off into a standalone department of child safety. And Governor Doug Ducey faced a deadline today at close of business to either sign or veto the final 33 bills from this year's legislative session. Earlier today, the governor signed the biggest remaining piece of legislation, a finance measure that gives the state's three universities bonding authority to borrow up to $1 billion for repairs and new construction. The Arizona Town Hall is hosting an event in Hermosillo, Sonora, Mexico later this week. The Hermosillo Town Hall will focus on issues that impact and could benefit the Arizona Sonoran region, including business, immigration, and border security. Joining us now is town hall participant and attorney Patrick Welch of Jennings Strauss. Good to have you here. Thanks for joining Thanks, us. Thanks, Ted. Thanks for having me. Uh, the purpose of this Hermosillo Town Hall is what? Well, this is a spinoff of the 108th Arizona Town Hall that happened last April. And one of the recommendations that came from that 108th Arizona Town Hall was to host a town hall in Sonora uh, in order to get a more broad perspective of uh, opinion from uh, Sonorans in terms of the importance of the Arizona-Mexico relationship, particularly as it relates to Arizona and Sonora with trade infrastructure, um, cultural exchange, uh, lots of different things. And I noticed that, um, before we get too far ahead, who participates in this and how are the participants chosen? Well, normally the Arizona Town Hall for their annual event, it's by invite only, and it typically identifies uh, a broad spectrum of the, uh, the, the, the population in Arizona. Um, in this instance, since it was our first venture into Aramosillo and into Sonora, we really kind of took an approach of opening up the invitation and, and uh, to everyone. And it was a really good opportunity to get a broad uh, group of people to participate. Right now we've got about 65 people signed up and we're hoping we're going to be around 80 by the time we're all ready to go. All right, Sonora and Arizona, uh, both regions, how do they benefit? Give us some particulars here. How do they benefit from a stronger economy? Well, I think one of the good starting points to look at is if you look at NAFTA and the importance of NAFTA over the last 25 years. Um, the economic impact of NAFTA has been significant. Now I believe it's almost $580 million in trade between the United States and Mexico. Um, that's the third largest trading partner, if I recall. In terms of the importance for Arizona, though, it's our largest trading partner, and it's about $8.3 billion worth of economic activity um, going back and forth. So it's significant. Uh, and I think that's an important reason why we're trying to have this conversation. It's a little bit concerned regarding the talk that NAFTA either needs to go away or be renegotiated? I think the issue with NAFTA is, is like any deal that you have. Looking at it and trying to see how it fits into today's economy. It's a, it's a treaty that was passed, a trade agreement that was passed over 25 years ago. Certainly there can be improvements to NAFTA. Um, does the pivot, in my opinion, mean you actually walk away from it? No. I think there's opportunities to look at expanding NAFTA, looking how you tweak it. But certainly the statistics tell you that 
NAFTA has been extremely positive for Arizona, and I think that we need to continue to support it. Now, let's talk about politics, government, immigration, border security, all of those issues, and again, how they impact this economic region and this economic relationship between Arizona and Sonora. They certainly do. Um, you can't have the conversation about trade without having a conversation about security or immigration. Um, a lot of those issues, though, are dealt with at a federal level um, that Arizona and its uh, its political dynamic doesn't necessarily have a lot of control over. But I think we can be in there uh, having a voice, uh, lobbying our, our, our federal uh, government to help uh, expand and, and, and address the issues with respect to um, border security and immigration. But you know there needs to be a good balance. And I think that's the, the important takeaway is you can't have border security, border security, border security, and just have a sole focus on that. Having a focus on how do you deal with trade and balance that with security issues, I think, is the key. Uh, it had been relatively strident, this conversation, and the voices coming from Arizona, not national, but Arizona, sure. uh, impact on the relationship. Yeah, I think that the, the voices coming out of Arizona have, have been important. And I think one of the big issues that came out of the 108th Arizona Town Hall was having a consistent and uh, constant voice that articulated what are the benefits of Arizona Sonora relationship? What are the benefits of for Arizona and Mexico? And I think that's been one of the, the biggest focal points. And this is one of the reasons we're going to Aramosillo is we want to tell the story. Okay. But I'm, I, I'm, what I'm getting at is in the past, that relationship or that dynamic wasn't as positive as it is now. No, and I think I think that it's it's continued to improve. I mean, certainly we had speed bumps with SB 1070 and the negativity surrounding that, and that was actually one of the big calls uh, of the participants at the 108th Arizona Town Hall was how do we how do we change the story? How do we move away from what some perceived as a, a negative message into highlighting the positives of the relationship? So, so how does Arizona and Sonora work? now, and how can that be improved? Well, certainly there's been a lot of cooperation. If you look at Governor Ducey's efforts with Governor Pavlovich on the Sonoran side, it's been very close. And I'll give you a really good example. We were at a reception at the Arizona-Mexico uh, Commission Summit back in December at the governor's uh, residence in um, Hermosillo. And the amount of appreciation that, the, that both governors had for one another and, and communicated to the group in terms of just small signs. For example, um, bef uh, I believe one of the governors before the, that before he or she was uh, sworn in, the other governor came up and visited and already had meetings and, and discussions. I mean, it was very close relationship. And I think that setting that example and model for the rest of the state has been very important. How about the rest of the country? Can that be a template for U.S.-Mexico relations? Certainly. And I think that's one of the things that the town hall has looked at. Um, and I think I think that's also something that um, our local um, politicians, in terms of both governors on, on both sides of the border, have looked at is trying to use Arizona as a model. But I think we need to focus also on the fact that there are other border states. You've got Texas, you've got California competing for a lot of the same business. And that's one of the reasons why Arizona needs to be at the forefront. All right, this town hall, uh, obviously business, economic issues, relationships, uh, moving forward, all uh, fine and dandy. Border wall, how much is that going to be included in the conversation? Well, the border wall certainly came out at the 108th Arizona Town Hall, and it came out at the community town halls that the, the Arizona Town Hall hosted throughout the uh, state over the last year. Um, it's certainly going to be a topic of discussion. People are um, interested in understanding how you balance the security issues and concerns that people have. Um, and balancing that with how do you drive economic development. Certainly if you put up a wall that, uh, that, uh, is, is the, that constrains trade to the point where you don't have economic development, that's not going to strike the appropriate balance, in my opinion, that you need to have. Uh, moving forward, I think the, the conversation needs to be on how do you balance. And, and, and how do you focus on that? And, and, and we talk about a wall and you talk about getting, you know, getting the pathway clearer between both sides. I would imagine transportation issues are huge. Certainly. Uh, and that's been one of the biggest focuses. I mean, both I mean, on, on government across the board, whether it's federal, state or local, has been how you improve movement of people how you improve movement of goods across mm -hmm. the border. Um, the, the most striking example has been the border investment that went uh, in Nogales that was done a couple of years ago. Um, 
250 or 300 million dollar investment is what what I recall but having uh, an ability to move traffic across the border one of the biggest recommendations was uh, from the 108th Arizona town hall was how do you pr improve the infrastructure of the roads going up to the border um, on both sides mm. in other words you have traffic coming in with a two-lane highway how do you bring trucks to one area, passenger cars to another, to in order to make the goods get over quicker, get the people over quicker. I mean, certainly you've got not only the goods and services that are coming across the border, but you've got tourism. We want people coming to Arizona to enjoy it. And, and just in the same vein, I think people from the Snorin community wants Arizona is coming to places like Rocky Point that you and I talked about off air or, or uh, San Carlos, for example. Sure. Uh, last question here. Okay, this is a town hall. There's going to be recommendations. You already talked about recommendations from the previous town hall. What happens to these recommendations? Well, the recommendations, so this town hall is, is a, a smaller town hall because it's a community town hall. It's not a three-day program. It's a one-day program. So the format for this particular program will be the 60, 100, whatever number of people we're going to have in the room will be placed at different tables. And from that, the consensus of the room over the day will be developed and recorded in the regular town hall format that everybody is accustomed to. And that report will then be generated, and there will be recommendations in that report, as we talked about. Those re reports will then be circulated to business associations, working groups, uh, nonprofits, our, our political leaders, our business leaders. And, and there's certainly questions all the time, well, does it get stuck in the drawer? Right. I don't think so. And I think part of the, the obligation and responsibility of the people attending the town hall is, and it's the last question that's asked of every participant, what are you going to do? Right. And that, that is always the question really when it comes to town hall. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Uh, good stuff. Good to have you here. Thanks Thank for joining us. Thanks, Ted. I appreciate it. You are watching Arizona Horizon. Up next, we'll hear about efforts to learn what's beneath the ice on one of the moons of Jupiter. Sometimes I wish I wasn't so beloved. What is under the ice of Jupiter's moon Europa? It's a question that could be answered by way of a seismometer that's being developed by researchers at ASU. Here now is ASU seismologist Edward Garnero to tell us more about what's being called a planetary stethoscope. Welcome to Arizona Horizon. Good Thank to you have for you here. Me. Planetary stethoscope. Explain, please. That sounds good, doesn't it? It does. <laughs> well, just the way we look in the human body. We want to know what's in there. Sometimes when things aren't going so well, uh, we do the same things with planets, with Earth, with the moon. And Europa is fascinating, this moon of Jupiter, because it might be the most likely place for life in our solar system today, in this salty ocean that's beneath this shiny ice shell surrounding it. So how, you can't drill that deep, right? So, right? so you listen. So seismometers, it's just basically a fancy word for something that measures vibrations, and we listen just like ultrasound. Yeah, well, I think we have a shot here of Europa, and when you look at the, when you look at the moon, you see cracks. Those cracks, that's cracks in ice, correct? Yes. And so the idea is to put a seismometer on there and listen to the ice crack? Absolutely. Europa's going around Jupiter, and it's under tremendous stresses from Jupiter's gravity and so the ice shell actually is deforming and cracking. And so you can hear that. Yeah. And so it's not only like being able to detect how much does the ice crack and where, it's a source of energy that we could actually use to image 
Uh, not, indeed, and you know that there's water under there because, and we've talked about this with our friend Lawrence Krauss here, mm -hmm. there are plumes and there, there, there are visuals of these plumes of water mm. shooting up out of the ice. Yes. That means something's there, and there it is. I mean, you can see it right there, correct? Yes. So the idea is to find out how much water and what that water's doing? Well, we have a bunch of questions we would love to address. One of them is, if water is a key ingredient of life, and you, you land this tiny thing, right, the size of your Mini Cooper or smaller. Is that, so that's the size of it? but the, A little smaller, actually. Okay. Maybe more like a smart car, but not so tall. Okay. And uh, people are thinking about these designs right now. You land it on a surface. So how can you, how can you address the question, is there life on this body? So you say, well, let's, let's look for the water. So one thing to do is how thick is the ice shelf? Where does the ocean start beneath it? And are there pockets of water in the ice around the lander? And so if there are pockets of ice, there might be interesting chemistry. In and, and I would think, again, correct me if I'm wrong, but I know that the, you have a visual of a dark spot with like minerals that have been basically deposited by the water that is released. There you go. I guess you, you, base, you, you kind of want to get as close to one of those babies as possible, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And again, as far as the, uh, the water being submerged underneath it, we have a cross section now of the ice because we don't, you don't really know. I mean, that could be a complete massive ocean under there, or you could have little lakes right beneath the surface. Or both. Or both. Yeah, and you can't necessarily answer that question with great certainty from photog photographs from very far away or orbiters, so you have to get down there. And economically, can you imagine putting a device on a very far away moon that drills very deep? That's not going to be very no. easy. So it's easier to listen. It's the same way with our body in surgery, right? If we can get away with listening with an MRI or yeah. CAT scan or ultrasound, uh, I think everyone's more. And in this case, you're hearing cracks, you're hearing pops. Could you be hearing like actual water moving? I don't know. Uh, I would imagine the cracks in the pops are going to be more like it, mm -hmm. and we might even call them ice quakes. This happens in Greenland as the atmosphere is warming up and more ice is melting. You can hear the crack doing that, the ice doing that cracking. Yeah, that's fascinating. Yeah. Now, the seismometer itself, you say it's about the size of maybe a Mini Cooper or something along those lines. No, no, I'm sorry. I, that's about the size of the lander, the, the, the thing. It's a big box with legs that will oh, okay. settle down on the surface. Seismometer is what? Even smaller, I would imagine. Yeah, so the seismometer, there's two things. There's the actual sensor, which is about the size of these old film canisters before digital yeah. uh, devices. Then there are the uh, four of them together, like shown in this image, where they're all pointing in different directions, uh, and there's an extra one in case one of them yeah. craps out. And so that allows the vibrations to be measured in all three directions so we could even tell which way energy is coming from. So that package is uh, you know, a little bit bigger than a very large coffee mug. And uh, we, if you could have one of those on each leg of the lander, that will enable us to image the subsurface. The subsurface there, because you just you never know what's a mile or two around the corner, do you? Absolutely, absolutely. Well, Seism seismologists like myself, we're kind of greedy. We want more and more data, <laughs> of more instruments everywhere, because it really is like if, if you had to plug one ear and say where something's coming from, it's a little more difficult, right? Yes. So the more of these we have, the more accurately we can determine direction and the character of the energy that's coming. The development of this seismometer, is this helping develop the quality of sensors in general? Yes and no, it's a new kind of sensor. Uh, and on Earth, they're very detailed sensors, but they, they get big enough where it's not economically feasible to send a bunch of them to a faraway planet. So this is a new design where it's actually filled with fluid and a, a, a microchip that measures the motion of the fluid. And so they're, they're, the benefit of these is they're extremely durable. You could hit it with a sledgehammer. In other words, you could throw it at a planet from an orbiter. You yeah. don't have to land it. But, but, but when it lands, though, you'd want to make sure, I mean, has it got little, like, rubber feelies at the bottom so it doesn't go sliding off? It needs to stay still, doesn't it? That's right. You wouldn't want it to bounce around. No. So that kind of technology is called a penetrator, where you'd put it in, like, something that's heavy and pointed, so when it goes in, it jams ah, itself into the okay. surface. Okay. For Europa, we expect that NASA will 
uh, send a lander, which is something that actually lands on the surface. Okay, so. and, and when you say that, we get to the point of the fact that we really don't have this mission going yet, do we, or do that's, we? That's correct. NASA, NASA has announced that it may do a call for proposals for the first phase of studying the feasibility of instruments that could go on such a mission if it's funded. And if it's funded. That's right. Now, how long would it take for this size monitor to be, to be ready to go, up and operational? It could be a few years. That's right. And so right now the sensor is being developed. That's the actual thing that listens and mm -hmm. measures the vibration. And then there's the parts of it that record it and power it and transfer that information. So, so when are you expecting like this? Uh, Sending a lander, the the uh, the Mini Cooper thing, not the not the little uh, the smart car. Yeah, there you go, the smart car. When are you get, when is that going to be ready to go and land on Europa? That'll be many years from now, and it's a long journey getting there as well. So, if NASA decides to have this program to send a uh, a lander to Europa, it could be that sort of thing. I know I'm guessing it could be in the early 2020s. All right, well. Good luck. I'm Thank sure you. you'll be ready by the early 2020s, <laughs> yeah. I'll, I imagine. Good to have you here. Thanks Thank for you for having me. at the state prison in Florence are training wild horses for adoption, but the horses are training the inmates just as much. Producer Chloe Ranshaw has a story. We get out here at six o'clock every morning, and then we come out here, we, got, we, we feed, we do all our, our, first thing that we gotta do is our chores out here, because that's, that's the, main, you know, the most important thing with our animals. In, in the actual functional sense, every inmate, when they come out, they start cleaning stalls, feeding. Nobody ever advances beyond having the responsibility to clean stalls. So, so you don't ever get better than, than that. And, and, and I think that's just kind of, uh, you know, the, the ground's kind of level right there. Everybody does that. In a general sense, what's expected of inmates when they come into the program is that they're willing to learn and willing to work. But we're, we've got a pretty busy schedule out here. And, uh, and the good thing about it is when we're out here, it's a whole different world from being in there. You know, we get to actually come out here and, and you know, that we have a purpose out here. What we do is they progress from there to their ability in training, their ability in understanding the horse, and their ability to understanding the process. This is, this is my horse, Tonto. He's a looking tanker sometimes. He's, uh, he's got his own little personality. I like every inmate to have a couple of horses that they're working with and uh, it, it, a couple of different stages. So they may be finishing one and starting another. Come here, feller. The, the first horse that I trained, it was hard letting go. But then you realize that that's what, that's what, that's what our job is. It, it, it's almost impossible to not have an element of bonding there. And, and the most important thing with these animals is, is taking care of them, you know. It's, that's, a, that's a big thing, you know, because they're in these pens, they can't take care of them themselves, and, you know, they rely on us. They really have to make a commitment to the horse or the burrow, and, and the relationship, if you will, really, really starts developing there. By the time they've trained a horse, and they start associating those things. Here's a horse that came out of the wild, um, is, is not going to 
survive in this new world, if you will, unless that horse can make some choices and, and make some changes. With these horses, they come out of the wild and stuff, and they're, they're, they're used to living a whole different set of rules, you know? And it, it kind of, it really relates to us because uh, we go through our life sometimes trying to live two, by two sets of rules, you know? And you can't really do that. If you look back on, on just how much, you know, how much I have wasted, and I don't have that much time to waste anymore, you know? I've got, I've got kids out there depending on me. I've got grandkids. The guys may not leave here and become horse trainers, but if they leave here with a work ethic and uh, they leave here teachable and they leave here with integrity, they're well on their way. As unfortunate as it may seem coming to prison and stuff like that, this has probably been one of the better things that's happened to me in my life. You know, it, it just made me realize that there's still so much out there, you know. If, if I have to choose between you leaving with the ability to have a good job or you leave here with good character, I, I would always choose good character over having the ability to get a good job because good character will get you uh, a lot of places. Intent is to get as many horses adopted out as we can, find good homes for them, whether that's uh, individuals, trails, uh, trail riding horses, that's the primary function or primary adopter. Uh, ranchers adopt quite a few, and of course, Border Patrol adopts them as well. We have a few inmates that have gotten out that have the horse that they trained here. All right, he's my buddy. He gets to go home with me. They, uh, they say a horse is a mirror image of their, of their trainer, so uh, I'm pretty fortunate, you know. Head Instructor Randy Helms says that in the past five years, only two inmates have been reincarcerated after completing the program. Tuesday on Arizona Horizon, we'll hear about some of the deadliest weather events in history, including a cyclone that killed 300,000 people. And Arizona's Spelling Bee champ is heading to the National Spelling Bee next week at the nation's capital. That's the next Arizona Horizon. That's it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thanks for joining us. You have a great evening. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Arizona PBS, members of your PBS station. Thank you. Next time on Antiques Roadshow, this guest got a ring for doing a friend a favor. He kind of got in a little bit of trouble and called me. I told him I need a little collateral this time. What is this collateral worth today? Find out next time on Antiques Roadshow from Orlando. Tonight at 7 on Arizona PBS. Explore new ideas and new worlds here on Arizona PBS, a community service of Arizona State University. Throughout its history, Arizona PBS and volunteers have enjoyed a rich and rewarding partnership. Whether answering phones during our pledge campaigns, stuffing envelopes, or assisting with special events, volunteering is fun and provides excellent work experience, team building for a group, and a sense of community involvement and importance. If you would like to volunteer or if you have dropped off our mailing list, we encourage you to call the number on your screen or go online at azpbs.org forward slash volunteer. Thank you. Coming up next on Arizona PBS, life and world. Become a news source for the Arizona PBS Public Insight Network. Your ideas and insights can help us create relevant and distinctive reporting. Join now at azpbs.org slash pin. Coming soon to Arizona PBS. How are a million minds able to act as one? Flocks and schools, herds and hives. These are nature's greatest gatherings, swarms of epic proportions. They achieve what no individual ever could. This is nature's collective genius. Wednesday night at 7 on Arizona PBS. A fireball from space stuns a Russian town. I was blinded.